This is Small Biz Florida, the podcast designed and produced specifically for Florida small business owners and entrepreneurs. Small Biz Florida, talk that works for Florida. This podcast is supported by the Florida SBDC Network, providing the tools, strategies, and expertise to help Florida's business community thrive. Visit the Florida SBDC online at www.floridasbdc.org or contact your local office and get started on your path to success today. Hello again, Small Biz Florida listeners. We're thrilled to have you with us. And we are thrilled to be at the annual Flagle Conference, Florida Association of Government Guaranteed Lenders. Uh, We are on site at the JW Marriott. uh, And uh, here at the conference, it is a a gathering of SBA lenders. And the conversation uh, is all about uh, helping uh, small business uh, owners and operators get access to the capital they need to start, grow, and expand their business. We've attended the Flagle Conference for, oh gosh, three or four years, and I do find that it is one of the most important conferences for small business owners and operators. A lot of great information comes out at this conference. And of course, as, uh, as you know, Small Biz Florida was born to highlight uh, all the business uh, assistance resources available throughout Florida. Uh, Obviously, here at the conference, uh, we are sitting down with representatives from diverse lending institutions across Florida. Our goal is to bring you insights from all of these experts on lending. Uh, Stay connected. Stay informed. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button for Small Biz Florida, ensuring you're always up to date on essential resources for your business. And with us right now, we have Jim Parker, who serves as the president of Boss Group International. Jim, welcome to Small Biz Florida. Well, thank you very much, Tom. I'm glad to be here. I always like conversations with folks in the business brokerage business. It's an interesting conversation. It's uh, I like to, to hear about what is going on out there across the state of Florida in terms of people buying and selling businesses. I'm sure uh, the pandemic had a huge effect on all of this, but, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. Let's start uh, let's start, as we always do, just a little bit of your background pathway uh, to your current role with Boss Group International. Oh, I owned my own uh, business for about 10 years, Tom. It was a wedding wedding business. We did wedding photography, wedding videos, and tuxedos. Uh, we had offices in Orlando, Hawaii, and Las Vegas at our peak. We had about 35 employees. We were doing about two and a half million in gross sales, which in the 90s was pretty decent. That's very decent, yeah. And from there, we got killed because of September 11th, and that's when I started selling businesses. So I've been selling businesses since, since 2001. Nice. And talk to us a little bit about you are a certified business broker. Is there such a thing? Is that what Boss Group International is? Certified business broker. We, I'm a certified business intermediary. I got okay. my CBI designation. That's through the International Business Brokers Association. Right. Wonderful association. I'm a, uh, currently a board member of that association. And uh, CBI is, is, is a designation that brokers work to obtain through classwork and uh, selling businesses and things like that. We actually just came out with another designation that's called the Master's CVI. And uh, we got our first class going through that right now. There'll be about 20 people that will have that designation, uh, myself included. So I'm really excited about that. So again, a little curious. Uh, I think I understand, but a little curious as to why you're at the Flagle Conference. I'm going to assume that uh, a lot of your mergers, acquisitions, uh, sales are utilizing SBA lending? Yes, that's correct. I sell probably about 95% of the businesses I sell have SBA loans involved. But I'm actually here today. I was uh, on part of a panel that would just happen this afternoon. I was myself, a business broker, maybe a business broker, commercial lender, and a business appraiser and an SBA lender. We were on a panel. Nice. Um, what is going on in terms of um, buying and selling businesses in Florida? Um, are, are we seeing some generational, you know, shifts in all this? Second, third generation owners, uh, first generation owners, uh, no secession plan. Children don't want the business. People looking to get out. What is what does the space look like right now, Tom? 
right now, you know, and, and we're in Florida, so it's a unique, unique situation. Uh, what's going on economy-wise with, with Florida. We've got a lot of people coming in from overseas and up north looking to relocate, and uh, there's a good portion of those that want to buy a business in order to buy a business. But what's really great is, and you're probably aware of this, is that we are in, right now, the greatest transfer of personal financial wealth the world has ever seen, and that's the baby boomer generation that is retiring right now. And I'm seeing more in my career in the last five or six years talking to business owners that are 60, 65, 70 that are looking to sell their business and they want to go to retire. Prior to five or six years ago, maybe one out of 10 sellers that I worked with would be in retirement. I would say right now probably that's 80%. In fact, Tom, right now they're saying that 55% of all business owners are 54 years and older. Wow. So, you know, it, we've got a good horizon on us. And I got to tell you, I don't think there's enough of us business brokers out there to handle the work. Wow. How does, how does the process start? Kind of walk us through. Uh, a business owner uh, contacts you. Uh, and then how does this process start? How do you prepare them uh, to get ready to, to put the business on the market? It's a lot of education. I, my feeling is the more educated the seller is and more educated the buyer is, the easier the process is. That first call I have with the seller, you know, it's confidential. Business owners don't want their employees to know the business right. is for sale and their customers and clients and vendors and definitely not the competitors or the general public. So right. all the conversations that I have with the business owners are strictly confidential. But the first step is, you know, to kind of get on the phone with them, walk them through the entire process and how, how it works. And then from there... I collect financials from them, and there's no upfront fees at all. They're not obligated to use my services. They only get paid when I actually sell their business, kind of like a residential real estate agent would right. do. Uh, in fact, in the state of Florida, in order to sell businesses, you have to be a real estate agent. I don't ask me why, but that's that. So I'm actually a, a licensed real estate broker, but the only thing I sell is businesses. So we collect their financials, and we go through those financials, and obviously them and their CPA, what they're trying to do is they're trying to reduce their tax liability. Ability. So what I'm going to do with their help is unwind all that to see how much the business is really making. And from there, we'll determine the most, most probable selling price of the business and talk to the seller about that. And if the seller wanted to move ahead, we'd enter into a listing agreement. And that's where the real fun starts. Uh, go back that one step. Talk about the valuation. How to solve? That's a that's a pretty complex component in all this. Actually, calculating the value of the business. Yeah, it can be. I mean, it starts, Tom, with doing what we call add backs. And that's what I was leading up to before that, you know, they're trying to reduce their tax liability and we're unwinding that. And what we're trying to determine on, on it depends on what size business we're doing and see their discretionary earnings or an adjusted uh, EBITDA. But um, what we're trying to do is determine how much that buyer can make from that business. So we're doing those add backs. That's the most critical part. If, if, it, if, you're, if they're not done correctly, it could really jeopardize the deal once it goes under contract and the buyer's going through the due diligence. So you want to pull that money out, but you can only pull out the, the do those add backs on the items that you can prove beyond a reasonable doubt once you're in the due diligence process. Once we come up with that bottom number, whether it's a discretionary earning number or adjusted EBITDA number, we take that number and we're looking for other businesses in that same industry and the same realm of gross sales. So it's the same size, same business, and we're seeing what those businesses had sold for and we're coming up with a multiplier and, and attaching it to the discretionary earnings number. Now, from there, it, it, you have to look at the business and go, because that's an average of those businesses, and you got you got to decide through your conversations with the seller, should that number go up or should that number go down? And those conversations have to be honest, because when we do go under contract with a buyer, we want to make sure it gets through the due diligence process, and obviously we don't want the seller to be in a situation that something's coming back to them post-closing. I want them to move on for, with their lives without anything, you know, any clouds right. over their head. I, you know, interesting, uh, you know, thought here. So, so often we, you know, we, we talk to people that want to start businesses and, um, you know, they ask, can we get some financing? And our standard normal answer is tough to get financing for a new business start. Um, how does it work when someone is acquiring an existing business? Does does SBA treat them as a new business start, or because they're buying an existing operation, do they get credit for the 
so to speak, for the business's uh, history uh, and uh, of operations? How does that work? Absolutely. That's one of the critical things that a, that a, uh, a lender is going to look at besides the buyer's criteria. They're going to look at the business, and they're going to look back, and they're going to say, how has this business performed over the last few years? How is it supposed to perform in the future? And the fact that that business has been successful for so many years, that's what makes uh, getting an SBA loan on an acquisition of a business so much more successful or so much more likely to happen likely, than yeah. if, if it was not, if it was a startup like you, have, you were talking right. about, Tom. So, you, so and, and does it help if the buyer has some um, experience in the field? So if you're buying a restaurant, but you own, you operated or you worked in a restaurant, now you're going to buy a restaurant. That obviously has some bearing on the, the loan and it helps. Yeah, Tom, you know, I, I'm sorry, I'm chuckling over here. You, you, you're absolutely right that the experience that the person has is, it plays a critical role in the SBA or the lender wanting to right. move forward or not. And the, the experience does not have to be a direct necessarily. You can look right. at it and say, you know, they got really strong managerial experience, right. strong leadership experience, and they might apply that and be able to use that, but they've got to have some kind of experience. And the more direct experience they do have with that business right. is great. But Tom, the reason I was chuckling is you picked the one category, restaurants, <laughs> where I've always said <laughs> right. that a yeah. strong business owner, somebody that's got really good business experience, could own and operate, in my opinion, own and operate almost any kind of business out there. Except, Except for restaurants. Restaurant. So it's, I feel like restaurants <laughs> is an animal. Yeah, it is. It's, it's a completely it really different animal. Is. A yeah. restaurant guy should stick with a restaurant, and a business guy should stick with something other than right. a restaurant. How often do you come across situations where you've got an existing employee that, um, that's that been there for a number of years and the owner's uh, willing to sell the business to, to, an, to, to one of his operators? Is that, do you see that often in this, in this space? No, unfortunately, I don't. Because wow. a lot of times, you know, you got to remember, I'm working typically in, in businesses that are going to sell between five hundred thousand and five million, and that's kind of where the SBA, most SBA lenders, are fit in that realm. And so, when you're dealing with businesses in that realm, you don't have a lot of uh, uh, managerial hierarchy, right. you know, and what you'll find is there will be key employees in that yeah. business or, or important people in that position, but they might be really good. Let's take an HVAC business, for right. example. They might be really good at leading other HVAC people, but they may not have the business yeah, experience. Right. And I've already, makes sense. Tom, I've, also, I've, I've talked to a lot of owners that they have their son or daughter working in the business and their son and daughter have been working there for years. I, I see this once in a while, actually probably a couple times a year, and they're afraid to sell it to their son or daughter because their son or daughter might be really good at what they do, right. but they know they don't have the skills necessary to actually be a business owner and operator. Well, again, in this space, and I, you, you kind of touched on it, I mean, obviously the, the business owner, you know, they have really, a, I'm sure, no interest in holding paper or doing the financing because they're not going to run the day-to-day -day operations. They want their money. They want to move on with their lives. Yeah. So this needs to be a transaction that, that's opened and closed and everybody goes their separate ways. Problem with a son or daughter is you you'd probably still feel like you gotta be involved, you gotta yep. you, know, you gotta provide a little bit of mentoring. You can't and, go off into the sunset no. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Do is it is it pretty common for the seller to to sign some agreement where they stay on for six months, a year, uh, you know, and, and get paid, but they stay on to to kind of oversee the transition. Tran you know, is that is that common? Yeah. So so businesses that are smaller than what I sell, it's usually a two week training period. And business in the business realm that I work in, usually that training period's thirty days is included in the asking price of the business. Okay. But the but the seller has to realize that when the buyer comes forward to to look at the business, that a lot of times the buyer wants the seller to stay on past that 30 days. So, right. the, so I tell the seller, you know, usually you're going to be looking at a training period or a transition period of 30 days, and then if the buyer wants you to stay on longer than that, you should be ready to do that. And you're, you got to understand, at that point, you'll get paid for it. The first 30 days be free. Anything over that, there will be a compensation. But the seller has to realize, and these are conversations I have with the sellers, you're not going to get paid at the same rate you were as sure. the owner because right. now the buyer's got, got a salary that they got to take. They're paying right. back their loan, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Talk a little bit about the Main Street versus the lower to middle market. What what is that all about? Wow, you know that, that's a that's a fantastic question. So actually, 
There, yeah, that's typically what it's looked at. You've got your Main Street business brokerage, and then you've got your M&A deals. And I kind of feel like my position is upper Main Street. I'm kind of in between those two. So I live in both of those worlds. Main Street businesses, the definition that a lot of people give is that it's businesses that sell for under a million. And then for M&A deals, it's businesses that are going to sell for over a million. And I don't really agree with that kind of concept. I think to what differentiates a Main Street deal versus an M&A deal is the type of buyer that's going to be acquiring that business. So if it's going to be an individual, if the likelihood is that person's going to be coming and buying that business as an individual coming from the corporate world, let's say they're 40 or 50 years old, they've had a great corporate career, done really well, they're making you know a good salary, they've got a good net worth, but they're looking around and they're going, hey, I want to, you know, I want to, um, I've always wanted to own my own business and I'm tired mm. of making somebody else money and I want to have that control. I see a lot of that. That I would consider Main Street or Upper Main Street. And then the M&A deals is more when you're in a situation where it's going to be a private equity group or a family right. office or something like that that's going to be acquiring the business. Right. And, you know, I got, you know, I really do have to believe when, like I say, we're sort of inundated at SBDC offices with folks that come in and you know, they have that dream of entrepreneurship, the dream of business ownership. And to your point, they see, they see that that really is, um, you know, one of the more uh, effective ways to, to build wealth is, is I'm going to own my own business. But it's tough to start it from, from scratch. It's just tough to start it from the ground up. I mean, I really think acquiring an existing business really offers folks a great opportunity to get involved in business ownership and, and be an entrepreneur. Is that a fair statement? Tom, I, I, Tom, I could not agree with you with you more. I mean, I can't remember this, all the statistics, but, you know, a new business owner, usually they don't make, uh, you know, starting out, you're not making any wages for two years before you right. do it. Whereas you buy, you acquire an existing business, you should be getting money the first week, right. you know, because you got that established business. And then the likelihood of a startup going out of business, and again, I can't remember the exact quotes, but it's like 80% or something. Sure. Business in the first five years, where you buy an existing business, you've already got trained employees, right. you got a customer base, you got systems and procedures, you got goodwill in that business, and that is what's going to most likely make you more successful. And what happens a lot of time with my my sellers is that you know they're they're getting to the point that they grew the business as quick as as far as they could possibly do it. And, you know, you have a buyer coming in with a strong business background that's going to then take it to the next level. Right. And, and again, you, um, there's the mechanisms out there to buy the business. Starting up is, is tough. Mm -hmm. But SBD, SBA recognizes mergers and acquisitions and acquisitions, and they, they understand this. They, so there, so there is, there, there's loan programs that address this. Correct. I mean, there's there's just really more tools available to one to acquire something that's already existing. Is that, is that oh a fair statement? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you look at a buyer that, you know, let's just say they have, uh, you know, $150,000. You know, what they could do is they could go out, they could buy a business for $150,000 and right. pay for it in cash. And that's great. You know, I've seen people do that, and that's fantastic, you know, going into the entrepreneurship. But, you know, $150,000, you might be buying an ice cream shop. You know, right. you might be making eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 or so from that business. Business. You take that same $150,000 and you go and get an SBA loan, right now you only need 10% down for an, for an SBA loan. So you right. take that $150,000 down, you buy a $1.5 million, million dollar business, right. even after you pay that loan every month, you're going to make a lot more money, right. plus the business has so much more infrastructure right. in it, and it's more of a business than that local mom pa ice cream shop. Right. And you know, we just, uh, we just worked with a, a, a client that... Um, had a partner and, and she and the partner bought out a, a, an existing business and she just bought her partner out. And, you know, what they did so well was it was, a, you know, older established business, older couple had owned the business. So they went in and, you know, brought technology into the business, uh, updated the inventory system, updated the billing system, um, you know, did, did some, did some adjusting to pricing. And, you know, you know, they probably, you know, who knows, tripled the value of that business just by just by doing some basic updates to the business that, of course, the, the older, you know, couple 
didn't number one maybe didn't have the knowledge and certainly didn't have the uh, you know the inclination or the the energy to, to to update all that. So there are, I mean, I, I would assume there's a lot of opportunity out there like that where you you could go in, make some very modest changes, but really update the business and do do better with it. Uh, Tom, I sell businesses all throughout Florida, and I sell all different types of businesses, but my favorite seller, my I, I love working with this type of seller. It's usually a guy. I'm not being sexist. It's right. just what I'm seeing is, is ratios out there. Right. It's usually a guy. He may or may not have a high school diploma, and he gets out there in the workforce at a very young age and gets to know an industry, and it's, and it's a really, really hard worker. A few years later, starts his own business, one-man operation. He's working that, that business. And then over the next 20, 30 years, he builds it into this great business with yeah. a lot of employees, a lot of infrastructure. He's yeah. making really good money. Now his business is worth a couple million dollars. Yeah. But you know what? Those kind of sellers, a lot of time, they don't have websites even. They right. don't have them, and they're not using the technology. I've, I've, this year alone, I've sold a lot of businesses where, you know, they're still doing a lot of stuff with paper and pen. And I look at that, and I go, and, and the buyers look at that, and they go, that's fantastic because they're so successful with what they got. But then you get a, that a, a buyer that comes in that implements, like you said, the technology right. and the websites and just taking it to another level. It's almost like, uh, you know, easy pickings and, right. and it's great. And it's great. That, so those kind of deals is great for both parties. And those buyers tend to be the, like the buyer I was telling right. you about before that's coming from the corporate world. Yeah. It is uh, James Parker, who is the president of Boss Group International. It's all about uh, buying and selling businesses, uh, which has got to be a pretty exciting space in the state of Florida right now. It, Tom, it is. <laughs> uh, hey, Jim, how does one find you if they're uh, looking to buy a business? You know what? You or can, sell, you, sell a business. You know, you can check us out at www.bossbossgi.com, or always feel free to pick up the phone and give me a call on my cell phone at 407-927-8999. That's my direct cell, cell number, 407-927-8999. Okay. Please leave a message. You know you're working with the wrong brokers if every time you call them they pick up the phone because that's what we do all day is we're on the phone so you can also email me at jim j-i-m p at that's p's and parker at boss b-o-s-s g-i dot com and you are uh, i'm assuming you're located in orlando i see the area code or yes i am located in orlando but i sell businesses all all throughout the state of florida with gross okay. sales of one million to ten million okay uh, listen, I love this conversation about uh, buying and selling business because I really think, uh, back to our little comment, I, I think it's just a, it's a, it's a more effective way to, to become an entrepreneur. Uh, and there's, there's a whole school of thought now around this. It's called uh, entrepreneurship through acquisition. You can be an entrepreneur, but it, it really helps to go get something that's already, that's already existing and then build on it. You know, Tom, it's also a fantastic way to expand your existing business. You know, right. if you have a business in, in Orlando and you want to expand in the Tampa Bay market, right. you know, instead of starting a new office over in Tampa with all the right. struggles, and you, you just acquire, acquire an existing business. And I guess you'll help them work through the process of acquiring the capital through an SBA loan. You, you've got that expertise. You'll help them with that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So we work with SBA lenders. We've got a handful of SBA lenders that we work with on a regular basis. Okay. I've been doing this a long time, Tom. So like our, our SBA attorneys, I mean, the SBA lenders we use, the M&A attorneys that we use, the CPAs that we use yeah. for tax purposes, they're some of the best because I've been doing it a long time. I've used a lot right. of different people. So I kind of, kind of calm down and realize who's the right. best. So again, I think the I think the uh, the advice here is use someone who's who's been doing this make the make that process a whole lot easier uh, you know and and more efficient and and uh, more profitable for for the person buying and selling don't try to do this on your own yeah yeah absolutely and you know the one thing this whether you're buying or you're selling a business this is probably going to be the biggest transition in your life. So you really want to make sure that you get right with the right business intermediary, the right SBA lenders, the right attorneys, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure it's done right. This is not the time to go with somebody. Right. We all have to start out somewhere, Tom, but it's not. this is not the time to you know, yep. go with somebody inexperienced. Agreed. All right, Jim Parker. 
Boss Group International. It's uh, buying and selling businesses. Jim, thank you for taking time here uh, at Flagle to talk to us uh, about buying and selling businesses. Uh, thank you for your support of the Flagle Conference. Thank you, Tom. I really right. appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, this is Tom Kindred. This is Small Biz Florida. It's all about the Flagle Conference here at the JW Marriott in Orlando. Uh, it's uh, The room is full. There's probably... Uh, 450 plus folks here and the conversation is all about helping small businesses get access to capital stay tuned more to come this is small biz florida this has been small biz florida created and produced by the florida small business development center at indian river state college your host for small biz florida is tom kindred Partners for Small Biz Florida include WPSL and WSTU and Indian River State College, named the 2019 winner of the Aspen Prize for Community College Excellence.